Let me just read for you the Word of God, just from Revelation chapter 1. And here's, here's what John said. He said, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom, and the patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the Word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches in Asia. Now we will stop there because of the uh, sake of time, but I want this morning to talk about John because John's experience this day was no ordinary day for the Apostle John. No ordinary day. Sometimes, sometimes uh, we have days when we don't want to get out of bed. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it's a little bit of we need to be motivated. Uh, maybe there's deadlines we need to meet and suddenly we feel uh, life is just overwhelming us with maybe stress and different things we have to do. Now, John uh, John was on the island for the Word of God and for the testimony. Listen. They were going through a period of persecution under the rule and rule. And all the apostles before him were martyred, but John was left. And John was alone. He was in exile on the island of Potamus. I don't know how he felt being alone, looking at... Uh, Remembering maybe what happened in the past and all his other disciples now martyred and he is left behind. He's an old man. Probably he thought of all that he believed in, all that he preached, just looks like disaster. There was complete confusion. But this day was no ordinary day because this day John was in the Spirit. And when he was in the Spirit, he heard a voice. And I pray in the midst of our uncertainty, and certainly for us, church is a little bit different. We are meeting here, for example, on a, on a June Sunday here with, uh, well, I was going to say summer weather, but, well, it is our British summer. But church is different. And for the past 16 months, church has been different. For some of us, for, well, for all of us, we've been in some kind of lockdown, unable to connect, unable to meet in a physical sense. And maybe because of the uncertainty of, of life, there's been a, a period of isolation, and maybe you've lost a little bit of focus as to what life is or where life is going. But in the midst of uncertainty and suffering, Everything changes when John gets a vision. I, we don't have time to read that vision, but you, you read it in your quiet time there in chapter 1. He gets a vision of Jesus. And what a vision it was. A description of what he looked like. Jesus appeared to him. And can I say, friends, in the midst of all that we go through, we need to get our focus back on Jesus. Amen. We need to look unto him. We're not looking to in fear. We're not looking at tomorrow with uncertainty. We're looking at Jesus. And here's the vision that he got of Jesus. Not only a description of his beauty, but he gets a vision of Jesus walking amongst the candlesticks. And he's got them in his hand. <laughs> you know, Jesus is in the midst of his church. The candlesticks are is symbolizing a picture of the church. But listen to what John said. He said, when I was in the Spirit, I turned to see the voice that spoke to me. I turned to see. I wonder what would have happened if John hadn't have turned. And we cannot, God forbid that the church goes into positivity where there's no action, where there's no obedience. 
And I fear sometimes we, we have become maybe too comfortable in how we do church over past months that we, we forget that our priority is to meet together, amen. Our priority is to focus on Him. But John had to do something. He turned and he saw the voice that spoke to him. You know, here's the message we have today. God still speaks today because God is alive. And in your pain and in your suffering and in this wave of pandemic, what you have experienced, some kind of lockdown and uncertainty about tomorrow, God wants to speak to you. And He wants to speak purpose into your life. John's vision of Jesus changed everything. And when you draw close to Him and see Jesus beholding His glory, His majesty, and His beauty, you too will be changed. The difference between John the prisoner and John the pastor is a vision of Jesus. And in the place of prayer, he was in the Spirit. And this is the power of prayer, seeing God, amen. Knowing God's perspective. It's hearing the voice of God. It's feeling the prompting and the presence of the Holy Spirit. John, he gets this wonderful vision of Jesus. And he falls down on his feet and he worships. But John is on his feet because he has a job to do. He has a message to declare to the churches, the churches in Asia. And here's my question this morning. What is God saying to the church in Reading? What is God saying to the church called all nations? And what is God saying to you as an individual you call yourself Christian, what is God saying to you? Here's the picture I want you to see this morning. Christ holds you in his hand. As he held the church of the churches in Asia in his hand, as he walked amongst the candlesticks, he reminds them that he's in control. And here's the word of encouragement, despite the uncertainty that you might feel, despite as you look to tomorrow and think, what is life going to be like? This we do know, God holds tomorrow, amen. In the midst of all that has gone, gone on over past months, Christ would say to you this morning, I'm in charge. Hallelujah. I'm in, I'm in charge. Despite how you may feel, despite what, how things might look, I'm the Lord. I'm holding you tight in my hand. I'm walking amongst the candlesticks. You're not alone, even in your isolation. John, I'm still here. I'm in charge. Yes, your friends have been martyred, but I'm still on the throne. That's the message that John received that Jesus is alive, amen. And Jesus is alive today. I love what the psalmist said. He said, but I trust in you, Lord. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm trusting in him, aren't you? I'm trusting in, in him. And the psalmist was able to say, I say. And sometimes we need to say things. Sometimes we think it. Sometimes we feel it. But there comes a time in our experience, we need to use our mouth. And say, it's like the Lord's Prayer. We just don't think it. Jesus said, and say after me, our Father. There's something we have to do. And the psalmist said, I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. So I say to you, church, don't live in fear. Yes, live in wisdom. Have wisdom. But do not allow anxiety to control your heart. Because God says, I hold you in my hands, and my time, my time is in your hands. So John was giving a, given a message to the church, the church, the seven churches. And this morning, I want us to look very briefly at, at the message he gave to one church. The first message is the church to Ephesus. Now, I know we have just finished 
uh, our studies in the book of Ephesians and how we enjoyed uh, that letter that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. Amazing letter. Reminding us of our identity. Reminding us that God has lifted us and raised us and made us sit together with Him in heavenly places. So it's this church that Jesus has a word. And He said, you've worked hard. You've labored. You've been patient. And there are many things to be encouraged by the word that Jesus was bringing to this church that John received. But this church was lacking in one thing. It was lacking in one major area. They ticked all the boxes concerning their doctrine and what they taught. However, when it came to love, they were deficient. He said, nevertheless, I have this one thing against you. You have left your first love. Whew. Left. They didn't lose it. It was a choice. They had left their first love. And the rebuke that Christ brings does not imply that there was no love in their heart, but rather they did not love with the intensity that had been theirs at the start. And I pray that we would just allow the Spirit to look at our own hearts and stir us up. Do we still love God with that intensity and that intimacy when we first started our journey on faith? The Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. If I can say one thing to you as your pastor, love God with all your heart. Amen. Fall in love with Him again. Let Him be Lord of your life. Let Him be number one. Not your wealth, not your possessions, not your success going up some kind of ladder. No, no, no. Let your love be for God. Loving Him with all your heart and with all your strength. And just maybe I'm speaking to one, and maybe I'm speaking to one who's watching uh, on YouTube. And just maybe, maybe, maybe you have lost, you have left your first love. Maybe because of failure, you have left that first love. But you have made a choice in life. You're now drifting, drifting in your experience with God. I am reminded of Peter's experience. When Jesus said, Peter, you will deny me, Peter said, no, 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 not me, Lord, not me. I'm, I'm going to be steadfast. I'm going to love you all the time, Lord. You can count on me. I tick all the boxes. I will follow you. And Jesus said, you will deny me, Peter, not once, but Peter, you're going to deny me three times. We see the story recorded in the Gospels. How Jesus looked at Peter on the third occasion. I wonder how Peter felt when his eye made contact with Jesus. And they looked. Peter had failed. Peter had failed, denying him. And yet in resurrection, who does Jesus come to? He comes to Peter. Three times Peter denied Jesus. And here's the wonderful picture of restoration. Three times, Jesus asked a question to Peter. Peter, do you love me? And each time on Peter's experience, Peter was being restored in his love for the master. It's quite interesting when you, when you look at, at the Greek words for love because Jesus said, Peter, do you Agape me. Do you love me? He uses the highest form of love. Agape. It's an unconditional love. It's a love not based on how you might feel at the time. It's not based on your emotions. It's a love that is always, always there despite your circumstances. Despite how you might feel. It's the kind of love whereby God has loved us. Amen. Unconditionally. 
Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you egg pay me? Do you love me? And Peter's response was interesting. Because Peter says, Lord, you know that I love you. And twice Peter used the Greek word philio, which literally means a fawn. I'm fond of you, Lord. I care for you. I take pleasure in you. But it's a different kind of love. It's not as high as agape. It's not unconditional. Yes, Lord, I, I like you. Lord, I'm fond of you. You see, Peter, Peter, in his failure, was afraid of the intensity of true love. And yet, on the third occasion, when Jesus asked Peter, 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 do you love me? Peter responds, Lord, you know that I agape you. He changes it from filio to agape. You know that I love you unconditionally. There is total restoration. And I pray despite your failure, despite your drifting, you, that you too can come back with the intensity of loving God. Amen. Just like Peter. And here is the good news. Despite our failures, despite our backsliding, we can recover our first love. Amen. Hallelujah. Do you love God? Do you love God with that unconditional love? That He's first in all things in your life. That you love Him with all your heart, with all your strength. Is He Lord? In your life, do you know him? I want us for a moment to look at to look at a number of things that John knew about the love of God. And if you if you read the epistle of John and if you read the gospel of John, John knew something about this love. In John's in 1 John, we see that John knew the knowledge of, of the fact that we are loved of God. He said, herein is love. Not that we love God, but what? That God loved us. Isn't that amazing? Then we didn't want to know God. In our rebellion, in our stubbornness, in our waywardness, not that we love God, but that God loved us. God loves you, friend. Amen. God loves you. That is foundational to this wonderful love. You see, too, from 1 John that this love, it's not measured or controlled by how one feels. We see, too, it's a love that's incomplete unless we, we express love in loving our brother and our sister. If I can't love you, then I can't love God. If I say I love God, I must love you. Amen. It goes two ways. Church, we need to learn that. You can't just say, well, I love God, but I don't really like you. No, 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 it doesn't work that way. And John understood the, the expression of love was incomplete unless we loved our brother and our sister. He saw too that this love was incomplete unless we were obedient. Someone said that where loving God is not the central focus in our lives, our Christianity degenerates into a lifeless activity. And the church becomes a loose affiliation of friends rather than a community that will change the world. And I pray that all nations will be known as a people, a people who love God and love one another, and a people who will change the world. Amen. Not just a loose affiliation of friends. This church at Ephesus, they worked hard on they worked hard. However, they were deficient in love. What happened? What caused them to lose their intimacy with God? Did they wake up one morning and stop loving God? Did they wake up one morning and stop loving each other? I don't think so. I think they drifted out of love. And how many people are in church today and they're just coasting along in their spiritual walk? How many are simply being careless with their spiritual life? 
and they're drifting. The writer to the Hebrews said, pay careful attention lest we drift. The word drift is a picture of a boat that's just drifting on the sea with no anchors. And God forbid that, that we become careless. We become careless and we just drift and we don't have any anchors. You know, friends, in our experience with God, and particularly all that has happened in the past 18 months around the world, we need to be anchored. We need to be anchored in a hope. And we have a hope of our calling. We need to be anchored in the Word of God, not on how we feel. We need anchors in our life. And how many people are just drifting, drifting away from faith? How many are watching? How many are here this morning? And you are not where you need to be in your walk with God. God says to me, I have this one thing against you. Yes, you work hard. Yes, you are patient. But you have left. You have left your first love. Now, how do we lose something as wonderful as first love? I believe it's by being careless. Becoming too familiar. Taking things for granted. There's no respect. Or there's no longer no fear for God. Did you know that God's mercies are new every morning? Don't, don't, don't take them for granted. Because they are new and they are fresh. And His goodness, as we've been singing, is fresh. Amen. How can we get back to this first love? Well, here we find the answer in verse 5. Jesus said to them, He said, Remember from where you have fallen. And remember from the height from where you have fallen. And He said, Repent, do the first things, or else I will come to you quickly. And listen, I will remove the lampstand out of its place. Unless you repent. That's a challenge. That's a word of warning. You see, the church at Ephesus, if you look at the church of Ephesus, they experienced revival. It's recorded for us uh, in Paul's visit to Ephesus in, in Acts chapter 19. We read not only of transformation of lives, but we read that the whole city was transformed. In Acts 19 and verse 6, we see that many uh, came to know Christ and were saved, and many were baptized with the Spirit. And we read, too, that such was a move of God that those who were involved in the occult brought their books, and they had a bonfire, and they burnt them. And such was the amount of books that were burnt, it amounted to 50,000 pieces of silver. That's an amazing amount of money. That was some bonfire. There was a transformation going on in this town or in this city. Work stopped because little idols that they were making were, were, could no longer be sold because people's lives were transformed. And then he writes to them, uh, or Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, which we have been looking at. And he reminds them that not only have they been saved, but they've been raised up to sit with him in heavenly places. And so Jesus says, remember, remember. You know, part of our, our tradition, some Sundays, is that we come around the Lord's table. And why do we do that? We do this in remembrance of him. We take bread, we take wine, in remembering his death, remembering the fact that he died he rose again, and He's coming back. Amen. You see, the Bible says, forget not His benefits. Forget not His benefits. And we are people who so easily forget. <coughs> and as you get older, you start to forget more and more things. I won't go there. I won't go there. I couldn't remember where I put my car keys this morning, but I left them somewhere. Uh, so if you see them, just let me know. <laughs> but we forget things. 
We are people who so easily forget. And we forget God's grace and we forget God's mercy and we forget God's goodness. We go on in life and we forget how good our God is. God forbid that we cannot remember. We should not forget. We should not forget either the great revivals that, has, that hit this nation. I think of 18, I wasn't around by the way, 1857. But read about it. Thousands upon hundreds of thousands of people came to experience God because God's Spirit brought conviction of sin and of righteousness. I think of the revival in the 1904 revival in Wales where even the pits had to stop because the donkeys couldn't understand the new language of their masters because the masters would no longer curse. <laughs> Why? Because there was transformation. I pray that transformation will come to Reading. Amen. I pray that revival will come again to, to Reading. But listen, church, that will only come when there's connection. Connection with God. Authenticity in my walk with God. That will only come when the church arises and the church will seize the opportunity. Do not forget. We remember our past, but we don't live there. But we remember his past because it should spur us on to, to on our journey of faith. Don't forget God's goodness. Jeremiah said, my soul still remembers and sinks within me. And this I recall to my mind. You know, we need to recall to our mind the goodness of our God. And Jeremiah said, therefore I have hope. And though the Lord's mercies are not consumed, because His compassions, they fail not. They are new, amen. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Hallelujah. Every day I wake up, God pours into my bowl new mercies. <laughs> he pours compassion. He pours love, He pours grace, and He gives me enough provision just for that day. And that's why we can pray, give us this day our daily bread, because God is so good. We must remember, we must remember that the key to a deep relationship with Jesus is the issue of closeness, not feeling. And I pray that you make that connection, yes, with one another, but more so with God Himself. It's not how you feel, but by faith, and you live by faith. <clears throat> maybe, maybe I'm speaking to one this morning who's watching on YouTube, or one who here in this Coley Park school. Maybe I'm speaking to you, and you cannot remember. There is nothing to remember. You've never had an experience to look back to. I can remember before I became a Christian in 1975, I heard a, a girl share a testimony, share her story. And the fact that she had a story and I hidden, I didn't have, started to make me, me wonder, why didn't I have a story? Why could I not remember? I didn't experience God. I didn't know God. I was lost. But the fact that she had a story and I hadn't a story, God spoke to me. Maybe I'm speaking to you today and you don't have a story. I pray today that you will allow the Spirit of God to birth faith in your heart, that you will come to know God. You will come to know Him as your Savior. Amen. That you too will experience the love of God as you open your heart to the Holy Spirit and to be led to that place of faith where you experience His mercy and grace. But listen to what Jesus said. He said to this church, He said, repent. That's a strange word. In our, in our, in our modern civilization, we no longer, uh, we, know, we don't hear that word anymore. Repent. What does it mean? It means a change of direction. To make a choice in turning around. It's like if I were 
lost on my journey, uh, in driving my car, what would I do? I would stop the car and I would turn around. And that's what Jesus is saying. He said, don't keep going in the direction you're going. Stop the car. Turn around. Follow me. Don't keep doing the same things. And maybe you're wondering why life, why life is just, <clears throat> just going. And you're, you're wondering and there's, there's no hope and there's no joy and there's no peace. Well, stop doing what you're doing. Stop. Turn around. Repent, Jesus said. Make a choice today that you're not going to go on that same road. You're going you're gonna to stop and you're going to follow a different way. You're going to follow him and be led by the Spirit and be in the Spirit as John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. You see, repent, it's an action word. It's not a passive word. There is something you have to do. And maybe you have to do something today. Maybe you're not a Christian and God is prompting you by his Spirit for you to make that choice for him, that you accept life and not death, that you come to him. There's another word that Jesus said. He said, he said I want you to know renewal. He said, do the things you did at first. And speaking to those of you who, who are maybe drifting and you're not loving God the way you used to, yes, you've come to accept Christ as your Savior, but there's not that same intensity. There's not that same passion. And Jesus said, do the things you did at first. Meet with God daily. I pray that you will get back into a regular program, a discipline, a daily discipline of having a regular time with God daily. If you're coming to church on a Sunday just to be fed, you are not going to grow in your spiritual journey. You need discipline of meeting with God and allowing the Spirit of God bring you to the place of intimacy. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. You need that place of solitude where it's just you and an open Bible and God speaking to you. You need to know how to dig deeper. When the season gets hard, not to drift aimlessly, not to wonder, <clears throat> not, to, not to make wrong decisions that have wrong, bad ramifications. You need to, to allow the Spirit of God where you dig deeper in your spiritual experience. The Bible says, let the Word of God dwell in you richly. And God wants you, God wants you just to know that rich of experience of knowing him. Amen. Thank you. Patsy, I'll just have a little sup before I finish. And I'm about to finish. But I'm about to conclude. Amen. So I pray today, you will make a choice to love God and allow God to take you on a journey where you will love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Don't allow the cares of this world to choke intimacy with God. And here's one final word. Jesus said to this church, he said, I want you to return. I want you to repent. Or else, or else what? Or else I'm going to come and I'm going to remove the candlestick. Now, I'm not suggesting for one moment that they were going to lose their salvation. But what, as a church, they were going to lose? They were going to lose the effectiveness of their witness. And they would carry on as church. And church would look okay on the outside. They would sing and they would worship and they would meet. But there was no influence in the community. There was no influence in their evangelism. There was no penetrating uh, into where they were living because the witness had gone. God forbid that our all nations, we just become a relic of the past, a monument of the past. But there's no move of God's Spirit. We're no longer, God is no longer moving in our midst. I pray that will never happen. 
But Jesus says this, unless you return to the first love, I'm going to come and I'm going to remove the candlestick. I pray that will never happen at all nations. But that depends on you, church, because we are church. It depends on you as an individual. I pray, I pray today, the Spirit of God will just challenge us. Let's pray together. Amen. Maybe you've come today and you don't know the Lord. Maybe I'm speaking to one who's watching. And you don't know God. You're, you don't have a testimony. You, you, don't, you can't remember. And today, by the Spirit of God, you can come to a place of faith. I'm going to make a prayer. And you can say that prayer in your own heart. And here's the prayer to make. Because the Bible says, when we call upon Him, we shall be saved. And here's the prayer. You pray after me. Father, I come to you today. And Lord, you know my heart. I have nothing to share because I've never experienced your love. I've never experienced your grace. And today I accept your son. Today I come to you. And today I receive you as my God and as my Savior. And today I turn to you to receive your gift of eternal life. Please come and take control of my life. For I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And if you have made that prayer today, why don't you email us? Or if you're here today, why don't you mention to a friend? Because we would like to give you some literature. Because God wants you on a journey of faith that you experience His deep, deep love. But maybe I'm speaking to you today and you're a Christian, but your love has gone. Yes, you, you come to church and you connect, but, but somehow you don't love God. There's not that same intensity that when you first became a Christian. Life has got busy. And I pray, I pray today that the Spirit of God will bring us to that place where we say, Lord, we return to you. Holy Spirit, lead us to that place of intimacy. Help us. Help us to come to you. Amen. Thank you, Warren. God bless.